Hi everyone and welcome to News Take. I'm Rebecca Frank, VP of Research and Insights at the News Media Alliance. For those of you joining us for the first time, News Take conversations are designed to dive deep into topics shaping the publishing industry. And today I am overjoyed to get the perspective of someone whose career has bridged both the magazine and news publishing worlds. My guest, Lisa Hughes, is publisher and CEO of the Philadelphia Inquirer and is the first female publisher in the company's history. She served on the Inquirer's board of directors since 2018. Throughout her career, she has launched, built, and transformed media brands, including The New Yorker, Condé Nast, Traveler, and Vanity Fair. Before joining the Inquirer, she served as chief business officer of The New Yorker and publisher of Condé Nast Traveler. And of course, we couldn't forget to mention that Lisa serves on the board of the News Media Alliance. So thank you so much for joining us, Lisa. Oh, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> Great. So first, um, I'd love to know about your career path and how you got here and where you began. You know, it's a conversation I'm having a lot because I have two college age children. One just graduated, one's about to graduate. So this is a lot of conversations about mm -hmm. how do you start in your career, you know, with their friends. Um, and, you know, it really wasn't anything more profound than I love to read. I love magazines. I love, you know, I grew up reading the New York Times, the Greenwich Time. I grew up in Connecticut mm -hmm. um, and I love books. And so I really wanted to be part of that industry. Um, I wasn't a talented enough writer, so I had to figure out, OK, how do I how do I be around these people and this thing that I love, the thing, the thing that moves people, which is the written word and figured out I, I had a path on the business side. Um, and so I started in book publishing and um, you know kept trying to get a job there, but they kept making me take a typing test. They didn't make the men do this, they only made the women do this. And of course, this is the 80s and um, when I graduated from college and um, I kept failing the typing test. You know, I, I can type, but I look, I cheat, you couldn't look and you know, I make mistakes when I don't look. So I did not get a job or an offer or even pass the first round in book publishing and, and moved on to magazines. My very first job was Cook's Magazine, now called America's Test Kitchen, and uh, where I met the very young Chris Kimball, who was, I think, 28 at the time. Oh, my goodness. And he offered me the job in the interview, um, which, you know, I didn't know any better that that doesn't <laughs> actually happen in your first interview. Um, and it was a great entry into the magazine world. Um, I started ad sales, uh, and then I ended up, as you mentioned, as publisher of The New Yorker. Um, I joined the Inquirer board um, uh, in 2018, and then from that role was recruited to take over as publisher of The Inquirer. And um, it's been a, an incredible journey and a great three years so far. Yeah, and a, and a busy three years. Wow. Uh, yeah. But what a... What a what a story from uh, from Cooks uh, all the way to the New Yorker and now to the Inquirer. So, as we all well know, you know the news industry has been significantly impacted by consumer shift to to digital information access over, we'll call it the past twenty years, but you can mm -hmm. certainly broaden it. But for those of our our listeners who who came from the news side, can you talk about what that transition looked like? For magazines, you know, what unique challenges did you observe there? Yeah, well, magazines were disrupted um, by advertisers and consumers moving to digital platforms in the same way that newspapers were. So we experienced mm -hmm. many of the same issues, and the same issues played out. You know, um, but magazines were even more reliant on advertising revenue as a percentage of the revenue pie than newspapers. So you know, they were hit particularly hard. Um, most magazines had very, very little consumer revenue. Um, and in fact, um, underpriced the, the subscription right. in order to raise rate base, which is what ad rates were pegged to. So, um, you know, you had, you know, great, great magazines that were $15 a year, let's say, um, $12 a year, Vogue, you know, you know, many. Now, there, of course, were a few obsec uh, um, exceptions. Um, People Magazine famously had a very, very strong ad business, of course, still does, but a very, very strong consumer business because they were at, I don't know, $150 a year or, or whatever. And then, of course, the, the real role model was The Economist, who always had a much stronger consumer business than they had ad business, and they led the way. 
And that was really our model when I was at the New Yorker. And in my time there, you know, we successfully flipped the business from an ad revenue based business to a consumer revenue based business, which was the key, the key flip and, and the decision that saved the business. Yeah. Um, not every magazine can do that. Um, your content has to be really differentiated and, sure. and coveted. Well, and it's such a that's such a perfect example, right? You know, a lot of so many publications would would dream to be in that position so they could make that transition, but, yeah. but also to know that and to understand the value of that that differentiated content. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit more on your work at Condé Nast. While you were there, you were involved in multiple brand launches. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to talk about those a bit because I think those kinds of new product launches and yeah. spin-offs and innovations are it's something a lot of companies want to do. How do you think about plan for a new product launch and what would you call the keys to success for that? Yeah. Well, yes, I had I had the great good fortune of working on um, incredible iconic brands that were either launching a new like Allure or relaunching right. like Vanity Fair. You mm -hmm. know, when I was at Vanity Fair, I came in just as Graydon Carter had taken over from Tina Brown, who was a very big deal star editor, well known mm -hmm. in the ad community. Um, Graydon was an unknown at that point, you know, um, and you know, magazine. <laughs> like Vanity Fair was very much a vision of the editor. So the advertising community was absolutely freaking out over this change. And of course, it's an ad based business at this point. And so, you know, you really have to think about how are we going to reassure the ad community? And that's with innovation and coming up with something new. And Graydon's idea um, which was the winning idea was the first was the Hollywood issue, which has become a franchise for Vanity Fair. Yeah. But um, the Hollywood issue where, you know, he would he did for the very first time that triple gatefold mm -hmm. with the Anne Leibowitz photograph of, you know, the most important actresses of the time on the first panel and then the up and comers on panel two and three. And, it, you know, we sold a four page gatefold to Tommy Hilfiger and you know hundreds of pages of advertising because you're really marketing it as a new product and this thing that's you know um going to be so meaningful to hollywood so you have to have a vision you have to get out there and, and market it um and we knew um the second it hit that it was a big fat issue in folio yeah. that over 400 pages or something oh. That um, it would signal that the the brand was back, and and it did. It it was overnight, and I'll never forget because um, one of the actresses on panel two or three that was the up and comer unknown, with the entire sales staff, we had to practice saying her name, which was Gwyneth. No, <laughs> Altro. No, Gwyneth oh. Altro. And we had such trouble remembering this person that no one had heard of. And, you know, it's kind of fun. But, you know, so I think I it's having that. a new idea to reboot and, and get people to look at you anew to answer your question and sort of say, wow, there's something new going on here. And of course, I think in newspapers, that's newsletter strategy, that's top of funnel strategy, which mm -hmm. is how do I get someone to look at you? They have a preconceived notion. How do I how do we get you to look at you anew and say, wow, there's more here than I thought. Um, and and and, you know, that's that's the game. Um, you know, we I, I was on the team with Linda Wells that launched Allure from the ground floor up. And that's the other piece, which is you borrow your equity. We could say from the publishers of Vogue, mm -hmm. um, we are bringing you something new, a magazine that's all about beauty. Um, and you have credibility. So that flanker brand strategy, you know, in the same way the Times, you know, was able to really lean into the food app and, and make that a real business. Um, or Wirecutter is a great example, that flanker brand strategy. They had permission. They brought the DNA of the brand to the market with a, you know, a relevant extension of their brand. And of course, those two examples have been winners. Yeah. So... You, you've, you've launched, you've launched the Vanity Fair Hollywood issue. You've launched magazines for the brand up 2018. Uh, you know, you join the the Inquirer board and they ask you to come on in this as the CEO. You make this transition from magazines to news. You know, it, it, what, what surprised you? I imagine you had some expectations. What, 
what which ones weren't met and which ones uh, and how were you surprised? It's, yeah, it's such a good question. In many ways, the transition wasn't as dramatic as one would think because, of course, I was coming from the New Yorker. So that right. is a daily, you know, web business mm-hmm. and a weekly magazine. Um, so but I, I'll back it up to say sort of the, the value proposition was the same, you know, journalistic integrity, fact-based reporting, accuracy, you know, understanding the deep mission with the reader. Those are all through lines for me. So that that wasn't any different. Um, I think the metabolism, the 24-7 metabolism of a newsroom, the news report is different than magazines for sure. You mm-hmm. just have to move and go and you can't have um, perfect be the en- uh, perfect be the enemy of good. You've got to go. You got to move, and you know, of course, the whole breaking news and and um, you know, being in the moment um, uh, and you know, a piece of the newsroom is is really key. Um, you know, so it wasn't as big a transition as I thought. Um, you know, it was the first time I'd worked with a union shop, so that was mm-hmm. a, that was new to me, and and um, you know, an important learning curve. Um, sure. And, um, you know, also how deeply important the newspaper is, the, you know, the institution is to Philly. You know, yeah. it, it, it is, it, it, we punch way above our weight. We, we are in all of the uh, corridors of power, you know, from the governor to the mayor to CEOs uh, to cultural heads. It matters what we write. And, and that responsibility um, is really something you have to take seriously. And what you say, what we produce, you know, the accuracy, the fact-based reporting, it really, really matters. So, you know, there's a lot more pressure there to get that right, to correct, um, and to really appreciate the power that we have. So, um, you know, I think that uh, that was, you know, something that I had to really understand deeply. Yeah. And then, of course, specifically, you started your role in early 2020, uh, a time that looked nothing like the year that followed. So, you know, you spent the bulk of your first year on the job navigating that truly uncharted territory, but also experimenting with a lot of new formats and ways of communicating this brand to people. So talk a little bit, if you if you can go back to that to that moment and talk about what that was like. Yeah, I started, um, you're right, in February 2020. So I was in the job maybe four weeks live in person. Oh and then we all went home. And um, so, you know, it it um, forced us to get really, really focused on how do we do our work? Physically, how do we do our work? How do we keep, you know, producing the news report every day, digitally, in print, getting papers to people? How do we keep our employees safe? So those are all simultaneous conversations. It's right. not sequence. It's all how do we keep our employees safe? How do we keep doing the work that we do? You know, we didn't miss a day. Um, how do we keep Philly informed? Because going back to the answer I gave you just now, you know, keeping Philly informed is a, you know, it's not just a frivolous thing. It is a really, really important thing and and uh, our mission and, you know, mission critical. Um and, you know, how do we communicate with each other now that we're all dispersed and remote? So, right. you know, um, what is, what's the saying? Um, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, we That was the birth of our live blog, which mm-hmm. we started um, with a coronavirus live blog because people needed to know in real time. Um, and that's been going ever since on any number of very important issues that people want to follow along in real time from our you know, we have a, our hundredth mayoral election with a very big field um, of folks uh, running for that office, um, which is coming. You know, the election's coming up in May. Um, mm-hmm. We've got you know an Eagles championship run that we just finished, um, and so you know that live blog was an innovation that happened then for us. It was new and and has just been an incredibly important part of our business now that we will continue. You know, another thing that happened in the middle of all of this was, of course, um, you know, we we uh, were roiling as a city in the wake of George Floyd's murder. We mm-hmm. had our own um, chapter in terms of our racist headline and really a, a, a much needed reckoning in how we approach our work 
the content, how we how we engage with community, and out of that work, which we called Inquire for All, we set up uh, workflows um, looking at content sourcing, voice um, process. One of the recommendations that we have stood up this year is the community news desk, which is now run by Sabrina Vervulius, a six person desk that really engages anew with communities that have been tr- traditionally underserved or ignored by the inquirer. And, um, you know, that is not only is a, a body of work being produced by that group of journalists, but it's also informing the work across the whole newsroom. So that's another example of something that came out of this time, yeah. um, you know, and, and I think we're the better for it. So, so super quiet, not, not a lot of upheaval, very easy transition. Those first 90 days, just very smooth sailing is, is yeah. what I'm hearing. Yeah. Business um, as usual, BAU. BAU, exactly. No, and it's, it's so interesting to hear about, um, you know, those, those changes that you've made, sort of meeting people where they are, but also meeting the moment, you know, building yeah. out the community news desk and hopefully you're, you know, you're seeing that the community is responding, right? That you, mm-hmm. they're yeah. seeing that you've listened, they're listening back and it's, it's much more of a dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, certainly always more work to be done. We want to get better and better at it, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. Just continuing to build that, that credibility. So, yeah. and, and of course the, the, the other challenge on top of, of everything that's happening, that's impacting how you do your work. But of course we're in a time where there are so many more uh, uh, calls on people's time, ways of attracting attention, whether it's, you know, the endless scroll of TikTok or the, you know, the constant just generating content of something like YouTube, you know, it's it's increasingly difficult to catch and keep attention. You know, yeah. can you talk about how publishers, you know, you've worked again on both sides of magazines and news um, to, mm-hmm. you know, to attract audiences with all different kinds of content. How can mm-hmm. publishers, you know, be better, continue to improve to get better? Yeah. Well, you're you're absolutely right, which is our competition is not, you know, another news outlet in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Our competition is the 24 hour clock. It's Netflix. It's YouTube. It's scrolling through Instagram and getting caught in Springer Spaniel videos like I do. Um, <laughs> Springer Spaniel obsessed. So you're absolutely right, which is how are you going to break through in someone's day um, so that they feel compelled to read your content? and further compelled to pay for, you know, that content. Right. Of um, course. So, you know, we, we think about this in terms of our content strategy in the newsroom, you know, to be three things, which is useful, revealing and responsive. So we want always our content to be those things. So that's kind of the lens that we look through what we produce. Um, I think it's about, you know, you said it, meeting people where they are. And that's, you know, something we all think about a lot. So, Newsletters, you know, a, a strategy that we all employ, they're, they're very effective because it allows people, you know, for free to sample your content. You can do pop-up newsletters. You can do, you know, the morning newsletter, the, the headline newsletter. Um, you know, we have a newsletter on the mayoral race, for example, that just lives for a certain moment. But it allows people to come in, start to sample see your content, build habit, build stickiness, and then hopefully they go through that purchase funnel. We just launched a podcast called Uncovering the Birds, which is um, our, you know, one of our franchises, of course, is sports because we have a, a just the best fan base. On the <laughs> now, an incredibly uh, vibrant and exciting sports town. And of course, we've got a sports desk that's been in every locker room, every front office for as longer than the teams have been around. So <laughs> our reporter Jeff McLean has been, you know, covering the Eagles for, for 15 years and have been all those conversations. So we just launched a weekly podcast with him called Uncovering the Birds, where he tells kind of those untold inside stories. Um, and that gave us a new product to bring to advertisers. Wawa's our launch sponsor. So that was super exciting and right on brand and message for them yeah. as a big Eagles sponsor. And it also, you know, allows us to push out to a new audience or, you know, a rallying cry for Phillies, um, you know, denizens who live in California and anywhere else. So, you know, it's things like that. You know, it's also we, we experiment with a lot of, you know, gamified content. So, you know, everybody knows the NCAA bracket. We did the cheesesteak bracket. 
um, which was really fun and playful and got huge amount of traffic and audience and engagement. Um, you know, you've heard of Wordle. We did Birdle during the um, Super Bowl. <laughs> Again, fun, very Philly, gamified, you know, just engaging, you know, and, and then hopefully someone comes in and says, wow, there's more food content than I thought there was, or this is really fun and engaging, or, you know, and then they might read an investigative piece or something else, and then eventually say, okay, I'm reading enough of this content, I, I want to subscribe. Yeah. So that's our hope. You know, you got to try new things. We're looking at TikTok, you know, what's our strategy there? Um, what makes sense, test, learn, you know, don't be afraid. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so clear too, just based on those examples, as well as, you know, the stories from within Condé Nast that I think so many people could learn from you understand and working with your teams, understanding who it is that your audience is, right? That's so key that, but also what can the Philadelphia Inquirer do, can bring that legitimacy to right that yeah. it, that it, that is in as you say the dna of of what the paper is as well as who the readers are so yeah. well we're 193 years old this year so we have been around you know almost as long as philly and as i said longer than all the sports teams so you know again we are philly we yeah. are as much a part of the fabric of philly as as any institution is so how do you bring that filliness, that sense of humor, that irreverence, that um, energy that is so distinctive in Philly? You know, um, yeah, we we, <laughs> we, we do know. <laughs> we yeah, all yeah. know. But I but I think that what's and what's so interesting, too, is that. It's um it's an understanding that the the inquirer is serious but but is able to have fun. I think that's yeah. a, a balance that not everyone is necessarily comfortable striking, but it, but you know, is, is valuable. It's, 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 it's honest, you know? Yes. Well, we have a lot to work with. I mean, Philly is a fabulous city and has great personality, you know, as the old, you know, founding of our country has, you know, yeah. such a rich history. Um, you know, obviously we have incredible universities and so education, medical community, healthcare, and then, as I said, incredible food town, incredible sports town. So we have, a, fortunately, a lot to work with. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that if there's anything to take away, it's that who knows what's going on in a community better than an organization that's been covering it? You know, maybe not everyone is 193 years old, but but these institutions, you know, if, if you're a legacy publication, lean on your legacy, right? Absolutely. Your legacy is a key component and it's, yes. it's part yes. of, of who you are and people love, and it's part of what you do and people love that. Definitely. So, so from talking about your legacy, let's, let's shift gears really hard and let's talk about the changes that are coming. There's obviously, yeah. you know, it's as AI. We look at now, the changes, AI. AI chatbots, the most recent of these potential earth shatterers. What are you specifically at the Inquirer? What are you looking at? And what do you, how do you see some of these developments changing what you do, if at all? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we are always looking at how we can harness new tech, the gamified uh, example I just mm -hmm. gave of gamifying content. But, you know, AI is, is a, a generative AI is, is a pretty a profound and interesting um, opportunity now. And, you know, how do we use that to our advantage? Um, and how do we protect ourselves and our audiences from misinformation that comes along with it? So, you know, it's complex. Um, you know, we could see chatbots and, and um, generative AI bolstering our, you know, call center customer service. And, you know, you're seeing this already in great use with the airline industry, a lot of retail. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we can get better there and take more advantage there. So we're excited to do that work in particular this year. But we could also see applications for, say, high school sports scores and things like that. So, um, you know, we we are looking at it to say, OK, how does this make sense? The AP is using it. CNN's using it. Um, you know, how might those lessons inform how we might use use it? And then also, you know, how do you um, avoid the confusion on what's real and what's not? How do you protect the readership? Um, and those are conversations we're continuing to have. And, and 
you know, I don't know that we have to be the lead on this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where, you know, being a member of the News Media Alliance and really talking to our peers and talking to the, some of the bigger players um, really is going to help uh, all of us, you know, approach this, you know, appropriately. So you, so you're not going to have the inquirer build a chat bot that just answers every question like a like a Philly resident who's been living there for 75 maybe, years. Maybe that's a good idea. I would, I would, I, talk. I would hear her. Her. There you go. There you so, go. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll keep we'll keep uh, paying attention. So for my last question, you know, I just you mentioned at the the top of our conversation, you know, when you started out in your career, they were taking that typing test, the the men weren't asked to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and all the way now to being the first female CEO and publisher of this brand that's been around almost as long as the Republic. Um, what are your thoughts there? How have you seen this industry evolve for women um, uh -huh. in your in your career? Well, um, yeah, I mean, A, there's no more typing tests, thank goodness. And um, <laughs> you remember when I was at Condé Nast, the very first female publisher, when the very first female publisher was named, um, so, you know, that is within my span of, of, of work history. Um, you know, I think it's using your, your platform to advance, um, underrepresented groups and, and, um, you know, bring the equity that you hope, um, you know, exists for, you know, the young women coming up and, and certainly, um, BIPOC, uh, folks who have been traditionally underrepresented in newspapers and magazines. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, first of all, it was really getting serious on writing a DEI strategy, mm -hmm. you know, not paying lip service, but actually writing a real strategy, staffing it properly, finding the funding to fund it properly. And now we've been at that for three years, you know, with a full department. And, you know, I'm really proud. I mean, some of our stats in three years, so I'm looking at, you know, fourth quarter 2019, before I started, mm -hmm. I started February 2020 to you know fourth quarter of this year women across the organization went from 26 percent to 46 percent wow that's a it that's really, a lot really of growth in not a very long time a lot of growth um and within the newsroom which was actually pretty good when i started 44 percent is now 47 percent and of course we'd like to get to 50 percent in terms of bipoc representation across the company it's 20 it was 22 percent in 2019 it's now 33 percent so we are making progress there. We'd like it to go faster. Of course, we have a lot of work to do, um, but we are making progress. And within the newsroom, it went from 24% to 31%. So we set goals every year for representation, you know, on the, on the you know, diversity part of DEI yeah. that we hold ourselves to, we report on every quarter. Um, and then in terms of equity and inclusion, it's, you know, um, you know pay equity study, you know, uh, development plans, performance and development plans, you know, pay bans and all sorts of things that we are, you know, looking into and implementing. Um, and, you know, I think that it's also using, you know, my platform and, and, and the, the brand to do really important work that shines the light on various issues. So one of the things that I'm really proud of um, completing this year is we, we, we commissioned a year long series looking at institutional racism um, from institutions started in Philly. So it was called a more perfect union because, you know, Philly was the start of our country, the promise of our nation, all the great things about our nation. It was also, you know, the first hospital, first fire station, first mm -hmm. university, first, a second newspaper, us, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, all the promise, all the greatest things about those institutions, but also some of the fault lines. And so we did a, a 12 month series, of course, starting with ourselves. So mm -hmm. I hired an independent editor, Erin Haynes, who led the whole series. Um, and then she had full carte blanche to hire whoever she wanted to do to do this first chapter, mm -hmm. examining the inquirer. She hired Wes Lowry, Pulitzer Prize winning um, reporter. Um, and, you know, we, we had a tough look at us, yeah. um, which, which was the first installment. And, um, what's very exciting about that body of work is one of the chapters called Lights, Camera, Crime, which looked at the origins of, you know, kind of if it bleeds, it leads, um, you know, newsmaking mm -hmm. was launched in Philly and adopted across news 
you know, broadcast news across the country. That's yeah. been optioned for a um, docu-series. Oh, wow. And a very good chance of getting picked up, hope, we hope. It has a great director and producer attached to it already, and um, that we hope um, will get picked up for a docu-series. So, you know, we want to start the conversation. We want to engage new audiences, and we also want to, you know, have a larger, you know, national conversation on some of these topics. And, and we think we achieved that with this body of work. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. Yeah. I mean, and just the, the act of saying to those specific people, you know, Aaron Haynes, Wesley Lowry, like come in, do the work. We are, we're opening up to this. I think that we're takes. Ready. We can, we're ready and we can't move yeah. forward until we actually acknowledge our past and where we've come from and um, you know, what, what, we need to do going forward. That's, I think that's, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, any, any other thoughts you want to share just on, on sort of where you hope to, to take the inquirer as you, as you continue to lead? Well, we're very focused on product, you know, what's mm -hmm. the best consumer experience you can have, you know, we are a consumer driven business. That's where the bulk of our revenue comes from. So sure. we think a lot about, What's that customer experience all the way through, you know, where they first, you know, maybe encounter a podcast, live blog, newsletter, what have you, all the way through that journey. Um, and of course, that's not only your content mix, but it's your product. How good is the actual product? How good is it on the phone? Um, what's that experience? So, you know, and, and using data to, to really inform those decisions and not just well, we kind of have a gut about this. It's like, okay, let's go test it and learn and, and look at the data. So um, I think you'll see a lot of progress with us. We hope this year on um, our our customer experience. That is that is fantastic. Can't wait to see it, Lisa. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak today. I'm I'm truly inspired by the work you've done and are doing, and really can't wait to see where you and the Inquirer and Philadelphia go in the future. Uh, that we can all follow. Thank you so much. Go Phillies. <laughs> so for our listeners, uh, if you have any thoughts or comments, you can reach me at Rebecca at NewsMediaAlliance.org. And please, if you can, share the podcast with a friend or colleague. You can follow us on the major podcast apps, as well as YouTube and our website, NewsMediaAlliance.org. Thank you for listening to News Take, and I'll see you next time. And thank you one more time to Lisa Hughes from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thank you, Rebecca. This was just a pleasure.